So we'll get this all worked out. I think we're doing pretty pretty well so far. What do you think? So it is. Uh, today we're going to be talking a little bit about relationships. And you say, why talk about relationships? It's the last thing I want to talk about, right? But they're important. We ready to start back there? Okay. Okay. The title today is You're My Mirror and I'm Your Mirror. When you think of the people you know, how can they be a mirror to you? Theodora? Say it out loud so everybody can hear. We're going to need microphones in the future. So, yeah. Relationships can allow us to see aspects of ourselves that we simply are blind to. Because you see yourself, you know, through whose eyes? Yeah, and Shirley and I, we talk about blind spots a lot in the classes, right? We have a few. Other centers say we have a lot of BS. We talk, we say they're blind spots, right? And when you're in a relationship, your blind spots uh, show up pretty quick. It, it's really easy, well, maybe not for everybody, but it's kind of easy being with yourself, right? Most of us. If you've done a little bit of work on yourself towards self-esteem and self-love. And then you think you want to get into a relationship, right? <laughs> I've done it before. <laughs> and it's all lovely when it's lovely, right? And then, and then it gets interesting. <laughs> it's still lovely, but it's interesting. Um, because when you're literally, you know, coming up, you know, I won't say, when you're joining with other people, uh, you get to see yourself. Um, how can we allow our, our relationships to wake us up is a question that uh, I borrowed from Ernest Holmes. Being committed to honoring the other person ourselves. Um, I had a few ideas and thoughts about that because I've been in a few relationships and I'm going to pass on the stuff I've learned, a few of the things. Number one, refuse to be offended is a good spiritual practice. Can you imagine what your life would be like if you refused to be offended? You're just not going to let yourself be offended. Now that's taking care of who? then people can be any kind of way they need to be because they're expressing life with the best that they got, right? And you can refuse to be what? Right. Um, I'm going to borrow from another discipline in the next one, which was the Course in Miracles. I am not a victim of the world I see. Ever. That ties into the first idea. Refuse to be what? I refuse to be offended and I'm not a victim of the world I see. These are ideas for you to really bring into your being. Um, so, I'm not a victim of the world I see, not now and not ever. I don't know about the rest of you, but I never have wanted anybody to feel sorry for me. I don't get any mileage out of that at all. <laughs> we teach empowerment here. We're not trying to get people to sympathize with us, right? I can give sympathy and empathy, and I'm happy to, but I'm, I'm not one to live my life as a victim. Some 25 years ago, I had a great teacher, Bill Tolliver, who said, this is a first-class teaching for first-class people. I'm thrilled to be in this building because this building kind of like has the vibe of being what kind of building? First class. Yeah, we're not in the basement teaching self-esteem anymore. In case, you, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> well, yeah, we're in the basement sometimes because we put ourselves in the basement. So that teacher was really pretty good. He was wanting us to lift our sights higher. And, and yes, it was a prosperous center and he taught prosperity, but really what he was talking about is overall lifting yourself out of what? You know, the conditions that you're in that are not life-giving, because life is brief and beautiful, and so are you. So, you know, we want to lift our heights, uh, lift our sights higher. So we refuse to be offended. We say to ourselves over and over, I'm not a victim of the world I see and I live in. 
And then the one I add in many of the classes, and this one's tough for people because many people are other referred. Do you know what I mean by other referred? See, I've been a therapist too. A therapist, if I'm listening to somebody in a therapeutic situation, all they're doing is talking about the husband or the wife or the boyfriend or whatever. You know them, you're listening to a person who is other referred. You know, and I'm trying to guide them back where? Back home. <laughs> you know, to the source of creation for them, which is themselves. So there's a line you hear me use often, which is this. In truth, there is nothing outside of you. Um, you hear me, I don't think I printed it up today, but there's a poem by Ella, Ella Wheeler Wilcox, Nobel laureate, poet, and I don't have it memorized, but the gist of it is she's made her transition and she's meeting God, source. And it goes, God and I in space alone and nothing else in view. And where are the people? the dead, everyone I once knew. And then God answers, nay, they have ceased to be. There's never been anything except you in, in me. Your entire life is a gift and you bring everyone into your world as a reflection of the love and consciousness that you have. And they're all there to serve you, to bring you to a higher place. Every last one of them. When we teach, you know, that there's a power and a presence and omnipresence, what that really is suggesting is God is all that there is. And every encounter you have is, in fact, a holy encounter, whether you know it or not. There's not a spot where it isn't. It's a presence that's never an absence. So every place you blink and everyone you look at is God looking right back at you. So, when we consider our dear friendships, and there are many, and Theodore is here, she's always smiling, about love, right? Because you're living from that place. If you have a, a, even a glimmer of that awareness this morning, that's a gift. What you want to do is you want to flame, you want to fan that flame so you have a greater awareness of that. Because it's so easy to go into the other place, right? Where I'm a victim and life is rough and poor me and ain't, and ain't it awful. And what do you think you create with all that stuff? <laughs> so when we consider all of our dear friendships, our relationships with family, everyone and anyone, it can allow us to see aspects of ourselves that we simply are blind to see on our own. I've disclosed to people before, I've been in recovery. Um, I used to drink a lot. You. <laughs> So uh, July, assuming I don't start drinking, that'll be 40 years since I... Yeah. Hey. Well, thank you. I think the universe had other plans for me than careening around roads and hitting trees and things. Um, the universe always has a plan for us if we can get ourselves out of the way. That was Emerson's, you know, get yourself out of the the way of the divine circuits. You know, your life is full of energy and beauty. And the only thing that's stopping you from ascending is, surely, they're called what? Blind spot. Your belief system. So we come to classes here and we work on it. And, and we don't want to be other referred. We want to know in our own heart and mind what's good and great, right? I don't want to have to ask people around me. I mean, you have to learn to trust yourself and love yourself. The work we do on Thursday night, the Louise Hay work, you know, it's always going to be about changing the conversation around with the most important person in the world, which is yourself. Um, when I was a younger person, I mentioned recovery. Almost 40 years ago, I could go in a room of people, and I was kind of smart then, still kind of smart, but different. I would listen and I would be able to spot every damn thing that was wrong with everybody in that room. And I somehow didn't think I had any of those problems. And now I know, oh my God. The fact if you spot it, you got it. And I could see what was wrong with everybody. So what did that suggest to me 40 years ago? You didn't know nothing about yourself. I was a mess. Hot mess. <laughs> you know, but... <laughs> 
I looked good. I sounded good then, you know. But, but why do people flee from you? <laughs> Looking good and all that. Because it's not attractive. Thou shalt not should on yourself. I heard that from L- L- Louise Hay years ago. So if you've got should going on in your vocabulary, take note. Because if you use that word, Louise Hay would say 47 times a day, it might indicate you've got some rigid patterns. And if you have rigid patterns, people are going to run from you. Because nobody wants to be controlled, directed, right? So as we mature spiritually, as we get our act together, we are not bothered much by what people do because it has nothing to do with who? You. You. Yeah. And then you get, you know, God bless the child who has his own. That beautiful song, right? God bless the child who has his own. As you really begin to love yourself, you see how your whole life is a blessing. And then you have a lot to give. You have a lot to offer. The other ways you've got, you know, some holy books, and you're going to go out and try to change them and change the world, and you yourself are a hot what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, be mindful when you're, all your conversations are about what other people are doing, because it's kind of like it's in a way beneath you. Um, you're, and you're also apt to be projecting when you're doing that. And I looked up the word projection for today. Projection is a defense mechanism. So we're always talking about people and blaming people. It's a defense mechanism of some kind where we defend ourselves against unconscious impulses or qualities, either positive or negative, by denying their existence in ourselves. So we project them where? I don't have this problem. This is you know, everybody's somebody else, right? Relationships can help us wake up. And they do help us wake up and see things more objectively as we learn to honor the other person and honor ourselves. Um, Relationships exist on a broad spectrum. Uh, The degree in which you're committed and willing to show up in a relationship will determine the level of the connection and the potential for personal growth. Um, The nature of your relationship determines uh, the nature of your growth through that relationship. So we have relationships of all kinds with all kinds of people. Um, The deeper the relationship, the deeper the potential for growth. Uh, So when I was putting this together, I concluded that we're all wired, see, we're all one with one another, right? So we're wired for relationships. The evolution of the role of the human ego has developed beyond the point of fight or flight. That's how we were eons ago. We'd always be fighting or we'd be what? Take it off. <laughs> We've developed to a point where we know that we're one, right? I mean, at least on some, we're getting a glimmer of that. We know that we're one, and that means we're about love and connection. So if you're not about love and connection, that's really where you're attempting to go towards. I was in a beautiful spiritual group about a decade ago, and every week, the facilitator would say, are you in connection tonight? And are you about connection generally? Those are kind of like big questions. Are you in connection? She's not saying, are you in connection with others? She's really, are you in connection with what? Yeah, because if you've got that, then you can extend that. But if you're caught up in a story about people, somebody done me wrong, then what do you think? Then you would say, no, I'm not in connection tonight. I'm uh, in a place of disconnect, okay? And what we are here as we practice this teaching, we're about connection and we're about love. And then we can extend that. The fight or flight function um, is, an, you know, that's a lot of the, per, the world lives that way, but we don't have to. Uh, ego, at this point in our human evolution, is here to push us towards connecting and going forward. Next point for today, relationships, as we've already mentioned, are like mirrors. Our ego seems to be striving for relationships to play out again and again and again. And for example, you might date a person that's been like a person you've dated before. 
and you might date a person who's been like the previ previous two people you've dated before. You might have been married some of these men or women, and they're a lot like what? The ones you've yeah. done before. We subconsciously attract to us those people who play into our story. Mm. Now, so I've, if I've got this thing like life is unfair and I've been mistreated and all that, I'm going to draw to somebody who's going to mirror all that stuff. And I'll keep drawing that type of person to me until I learn the lesson I'm supposed to learn. Bill Tolliver, who taught me many years ago, Reverend Bill, he said, don't die dumb. And I used to laugh. He put it on the marquee of the church. You can keep bringing in the same problem with your friends, all your relationships. Let's say you live your life as like a poor me and an awful a victim. Well, somehow or another, magically, you're going to be attracting people that are going to always be wanting to do what with you? Agree. Well, or, the, you know, if I'm poor me, I'm going to be looking for people to take care of me. And then I've got that whole thing going on. Would that be appealing to you? No. Theodore wants no part of it. No. Right. So you marry or you date men or women who seem always to have similar challenges. So it's a setup. Uh, we subconsciously attract to us those people who play into our story, giving us exactly two options. <laughs> uh, you know in every moment, either to relieve our pain or to learn from something. Okay, I brought in those relationships. I hope to God I've learned from them because I really don't want to do what? I'll have other lessons, but I don't need to have which? Not that one. Not that one. Again and again and again. You've heard the story of the, it's called the man in the sidewalk, right? You've told it before. You walk down the street around the corner and the person does what? He falls into the hole in the sidewalk. And then the next day, Theodora, he goes down around the corner, he falls in the sidewalk. And this is like a Monday through Friday, he keeps going out the door around the, and falls in the sidewalk. And you know, after a while you get bruised and battered and eventually, not because you've saw, seen the light, but because you felt the heat, you decide to do what? You go down, you go the other way. You know, don't die dumb is not to be insulting. Don't die dumb is to tell you that you have a great gift, you have an intellect, and you have a guiding spirit. There's an internal guidance system involved in, in everyone. Pay attention to it. You don't have to keep repeating, 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 and looping around with the same old stuff. So what does it take? If you were in a 12-step group of any kind, they would say willingness is the key that opens the doors. The desire and the willingness, right? It takes the willingness of another person or persons, conscious or unconscious, to play this role. Um, so we're in relationships with people. I don't want anybody feeling sorry for me, ever. Treating me like a victim, you know. Um, I, I want to be seen as a practitioner would see a patient. A practitioner will see a patient, I'm going to ask Theodora Joyce. Joyce, you're seeing me now and I'm giving you a story. How do you see me? I'm telling you everything's awful. But I'd be telling you, Joyce, it's so bad. Let's look behind. Let's look past that. Uh, and then I go to Theodora and I say, Joyce doesn't understand. <laughs> she doesn't understand how bad it is. And what are you going to say? Stop it. Stop it. Snap, a, snap out of it. <laughs> okay. So it takes some willingness to change here, ladies and gentlemen. People mirror back to us the things that are often hidden to us. We don't see ourselves as the beautiful, bright, glorious creatures that we are, right? Okay, so let's begin that journey together. When looking inward at the things that we try to hide from others and ourselves, we are met with our most exceptional growth. Listen, turn on the lights. All that stuff that's hidden, let it, let it out, release it, right? Here's a nice quote that comes from Holmes. We, we reach God in others by reaching out from God within the self. You have to kind of like think that one a little bit. 
We, we reach God in others by reaching out from God with, within us. Always the God in others will respond to the God in us. So if you slow it down a little bit and do what you were talking about, Theodore, what were you talking about? Okay, that's beautiful. So everybody, I'll say it one more time. We reach God in others by reaching out from God with, within yourself. And that God in other people will respond to you, right? But never beyond the level of our inward spiritual awareness. So we need to open our containers, you know, to more love. Um, that comes from Ernest Holmes' uh, writing called Words to Heal. The mirror is simply something that reflects. You cannot scratch the reflection out of the mirror. Think about that. The mirror is something that reflects. And if I don't like what I see, I can't scratch the reflection out of that mirror, can I? Okay. But you can change the image in front of the mirror, which is who? Okay. You're not limited in any way. You can be prosperous, and you can be whole, and you can have improved health your relationships can be better okay so again the mirror is something my life is a reflection of my consciousness plain and simple my life is not a reflection of what anybody's doing to me louise hay would say we're each 100 percent responsible for all of our experiences she's not saying that we're to blame for anything we're saying we're responsible if something's in your life and you don't like it then it, what do you need to do? Change, Change your thinking, right? There is a power for good in the universe greater than... And I can do what? Okay. You are an image maker. Ever hear that before? <laughs> you are the image maker. You are the image maker in your world. So let us create new images which will reflect new patterns. The suggestion always is to upgrade, to dream big, have a bigger picture of yourself, be more generous with yourself, loving to yourself, you know. Begin wherever you begin. You know, it's like um, cleaning the house, Louise Hay would say. Maybe it's your dress, maybe it's your apartment, maybe it's your relationships with other people, you know? Set your sights just a little bit higher. Um, my dad used to tell me when I was a kid, order is heaven's first law. So why not do as Emerson suggested and hitch your wagon to the stars? Why don't I claim more health, greater self-expression, um, more happiness, more joy. Wouldn't you like some of those things? Absolutely. Okay, or you might say, I already got them. Here's a few supporting ideas for today's lesson. We are biologically, cognitively, physically, and spiritually wired to love. Uh-huh. We're wired to love and we're wired to be loved. And we're wired to belong. When we are of love, we aren't, when we are of love, when we aren't loving, we don't function as we were meant to be. So we are of love, right? And when we're not acting that way, we don't function as we're meant to be. We break, we fall apart, we get numb, we ache. The absence of love and belonging will always lead us to suffering. That's by Brene Brown. So if you've gotten numb over the years and you've shut down, which many people have, um, start coming to class on Thursday night and start plugging in and learning to love yourself. That's a simple class and it's a great discussion because it's all about doing what? Self-care, right? Um, my summary uh, remark for today, which is you'll hear me say a lot, every encounter really is a holy encounter. 
And let's start practicing that and start noticing as you see people in the street. I learned from Pat Amy, a lady who helped me with my first church. She says, Greg, all I know to do when I see people in every circumstance when I meet them is just give them a smile. And you know, that's a profoundly simple but beautiful practice, mm -hmm. acknowledging that God in others. Some relationships are fleeting, just like in meeting on the street, very brief, but they, they're there for a reason. Every encounter is a what? Right. Other relationships are of years and of a greater significance, but every person that comes into your life has come into your life. It's a gift unto you. All are important, and so are you. Uh, pay attention to your relationships, your friends, friendships, and, and, and be aware, you know, and what purpose they're, they're there, you know, how they're serving you in life. And the question I oftentimes used to ask myself, am I looping? Am I telling myself a story? Um, are you caught up in a place where you're telling yourself stories over and over again, right? Are you learning so that you can move on? Are you longing for change but feel stuck in your relationships? Okay. Um, I don't want to be stuck in anything at this point in my life. I'm learning. Right? <laughs> um, I was in Denver and I had this thing going on medically last week where I didn't know what was going on. My blood pressure was going up and I couldn't stop it. And I thought, what the heck is going on? And I didn't really want to have an ambulance come to the hospital with all these ministers around. And I'm thinking, well, you know. <laughs> I thought, I'm whole and complete, and this can't be happening to me. And <laughs> but the next morning, I got out of there, and I went over to the hospital and um, got all checked out. And they call Denver the Mile High City for a reason. It's a mile up. <laughs> And I checked out and everything. But, you know, I was realizing as, as I was spending about eight hours being wheeled into all these machines and being checked out, I thought, you know something, life is not necessarily, you know, it's brief. And I'm, I'm always pretty conscious of how significant it is. And, you know, we want to practice some mindfulness and share the love and the joy that we possess. Because, you know, it can be over in a blink. And, and the thing is, you know, you want to, when you go, you want to go having fully expressed all the love that you've got, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. you, you don't want to die like Elsie. You know, you remember the song from Cabaret? What fun is sitting alone in your room? Come hear the music play. You've got, I, am I the only person that can remember these things? I, you know I'm getting older. When I go, I'm going like who? <laughs> Bobby, you know that song? Oh my God, you. Uh, <laughs> cabaret. Life is not a dress rehearsal, in other words, right? Okay, it's here to be lived, cherished, enjoyed, celebrated. Get excited about who, Shirley? Yeah, because if. Listen, if you can't be excited about you, Jimmy, who's going to be excited about you? Nobody. Okay. So this is your own glorious life. And regarding some of your relationships, you might say, oh my God, what was I doing in thinking, right? And a little bit of introspection re regarding relationships past and present is really helpful. This is a great way. Um, you you want to ask yourself a question, how is this serving me, right? If it's not working for you, renegotiate it, okay? Once you begin, begin to take responsibility for your for your life, your, your relationships, things start to change. And oh, the places Dr. Seuss would say you will go when you start loving yourself more. When you fully get that you are caused your own experience, things change. I want to close with something that J. Scott Neal put together. He's a friend of mine and Reverend Joyce's. Reverend J. Scott Neal says, I am the thinker that thinks the thoughts that become the thing I'm not the thing, I'm not the thought, I am the thinker. In truth, there's nothing outside of any of you, and so it is. Okay.